<laughs> Welcome everybody to the colloquium series for math for public health. Uh, we've got a fantastic talk uh, today and a distinguished speaker and I will pass it on to Tom for to do the formal introduction. Tom, please. Yeah, thank you, Kumar. Um, yeah, we'd like to welcome um, Josh Epstein, who's Professor of Epidemiology from NYU, and uh, he's affiliated with numerous um, distinguished institutes, for example, Santa Fe Institute and uh, Director of um, the Agent-Based Modeling Lab at NYU. Um, I think he's got multiple accolades, and uh, I didn't uh, go down the list, um, but uh, we're so uh, I'm 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 leading uh, P project four of mathematics for public health, which is robust agent based models. And so this colloquium is is part is uh, hosted by our team. But rather than just be internal, we thought we would reach out to Josh because we'd like to have uh, you know future discussion with with. Um, with him. And he's also written some amazing papers on linking human behavior with um, the virology and epidemiology of disease. And so that's why we're especially interested in the triple contagion talk that he's about to show us. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Let me see if I can share the screen now. Um, that visible? Is that visible? Yes, very yes. much. Oh, amazing. Okay. Well, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you for the kind of uh, introductory words. Yes, I want to talk about triple contagion, uh, which is an effort in the area I call cognitive epidemiology. But uh, my affiliations, yes, professor of epidemiology. I direct the age of based modeling lab at NYU and have affiliated uh, appointments at the Courant Institute here and the Department of Politics here. And yes, Santa Fe, a variety of other, uh, other places. Overall, the idea of this line of work is to deepen mathematical epidemiology to encompass human behavioral adaptation and its underlying cognitive drivers. So today I wanna to show a family of differential equation models actually with behavioral adaptation. And I'll come back to an, a, an advanced agent uh, toward the end of the talk. But first I wanna show the models of coupled contagion where there's a contagion of disease and also a contagion of fear of the disease that changes people's behavior. And of course, changes the course of disease and so on. And a second model that we just published in the Royal Society called triple contagion, which includes a contagion of disease, a contagion of fear of the disease and a contagion of fear of the vaccine. And these offer several behavioral mechanisms for multiple pandemic waves, which are obviously on our minds during COVID and in general. Uh, and then I will show briefly an advanced agent called Agent Zero with some rudimentary cognitive apparatus, some little equations for fear learning, and some other, some other important elements of a cognitively plausible agent. Then I'll quickly talk about our plans to scale this up with Courant and uh, other colleagues. But let's start at the very beginning. I don't know how many of you are familiar with epidemiology. So let's just start at the start. The whole field of mathematical epidemiology, I mean, although the Bernoullis were interested in it and others, the real modern theory begins with the publication of the Kermack mckendrick model in 1927. This is called the SIR model because the compartments are susceptible, infected and removed. And it's a constant population model uh, where the susceptible growth, there's susceptibles, S at time T, and infectives, I at time T. And uh, they, it's a perfect mixing model because the flow from susceptible to infective is governed by S times I, right? I mean, if you lined all the S's up and lined all the I's up and every I sneezed in the face of every susceptible, every infinitesimal time period, and they transmit with rate beta per contact, Yes, you'd see this flow from susceptibles minus beta SI into the infected pool plus beta SI minus some recovery rate or death rate gamma. And that's, that's the whole show. I don't know exactly what level the audience is, but I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, everybody's familiar with this sort of picture. Uh, and it's a perfect mixing model. And the characteristic curves are very simple. The susceptibles fall because there's transfer into the infected pool, then the infected pool dies out as people are infected, as people are removed 
from play through death or recovery. All right. Uh, and it gave several wonderful insights. It showed for the first time, really, that epidemics are threshold phenomena. Why? Well, when you say there's an epidemic, what you mean by that is that the infected pool is growing. The IDT is positive, but the IDT is beta SI minus gamma SI. So that must be positive. So the thing takes off when the susceptibles exceed the removal rate over the transmission rate, and it fizzles otherwise if the transmission rate, if the uh, removal rate, if susceptibles is less than the removal rate over the transmission rate. And this has immense implications for herd immunity that I think you've all heard about, which are specifically just vaccinate until the remaining susceptible pool is sub threshold. And this is the classic result for homogeneous, well-mixed populations. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why overly deadly bugs aren't very good at sustaining epidemics. Why? Because they kill their hosts before they get a chance to spread the bug to somebody else. But if we rearrange this a little bit, the spread condition is beta S over gamma greater than one. And this is the famous R naught that you may have heard of. Uh, a lot of people toss this term around uh, and it has several interpretations. Um, but the idea is that if it's greater than one, the epidemic takes off. If it's less than one, the epidemic fizzles. And there's much more advanced mathematics about this, but the condition R not greater than one really means the zero equilibrium, the infected equals zero equilibrium is unstable. Uh, and we can come back to all of this, but it produces a very pretty formula for herd immunity through vaccination. So vaccinees, little v, are subtracted from the susceptible pool. They're removed, they're no longer susceptible. So really you just have to vaccinate until the difference S naught minus V is less than the threshold, which rearranging means the vaccination level for herd immunity, for the thing to fizzle out is one minus one over R naught, which is a very pretty formula. I think. Uh, and it turned out the Spanish flu, 1918, uh, killed 50 million people worldwide. Uh, so, you know, back of the envelope, if you had a perfect vaccine and you were able to vaccinate half the public, you could have crushed the thing. It's very neat. Pre-Delta variant COVID-19, I mean, you may recall the CDC and uh, Anthony Fauci and others called for 70% vaccination. All right, so, you know, just for the heck of it, if you assume a COVID-19 R naught of about three, which is plausible for the this phase of the epidemic, and a vaccine efficacy of 95% Pfizer, you happen to get, you know, something on the order of 70%. I'm not sure quite how they got their number, but, you know, this is a sort of handy way to get a back of the envelope estimate of what sort of vaccine coverage is required to endure and to induce herd immunity. Right? I mean, the other way to do it is to let everybody get sick, but you kill a lot of people that way. Uh, that was actually advocated by, by several uh, people in the Trump administration. This is a much more humane way to go, obviously. Uh, anyway, this is, these are all just very simple formulae coming out of the Carmack McKendrick picture. Uh, and all in all, I mean, it's a, it's a triumph of elegant analytical modeling. Uh, Picasso said, art is a lie that helps us see the truth. And I think that's the case for all the best models, or at least I aspire to telling mathematical lies that help us see the truth. Uh, and I think for students and for aspiring mathematicians, it's important to develop an instinct for the right wrong model. Okay, George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and you know, all the hard sciences deal in idealizations that turn out to be illuminating, even though they're not observed in nature, like ideal gases and so forth. All right, so I'll show another example of what I, I hope you agree is a good wrong model. Uh, but all of that said, Carmack McKendrick gave very important insights, and it does work very well empirically when perfect mixing applies. So, you know, there's lots of curves showing that, you know, if there's a influenza in a, in, a, in a British boys school where everyone's locked up and the windows are closed, uh, you get a very good fit to these equations. And you do in many epidemics where there's good mixing. Uh, but there's an important problem with this setup. 
And it is simply that, you know, if you knew there were a play underway in your town, you just don't keep mixing mindlessly. You, you do something. You remove yourself from circulation, protect yourself in some way. Uh, Henri Poincaré said of his plague, the plague was nothing. Fear of the plague was much more formidable. So we're interested in including behavioral adaptation. And Agent Zero actually has a, a fear module with some simple equations grounded in actual neuroscience that I'll come to. Uh, but you know, classical models don't include behavioral adaptation, and why? Why don't they? I mean, it's obvious that this is happening, and I think if you ask most mathematical modelers, they'd say, "Well, you know, human behavior is just too hard, so we leave it out." And my answer to that is, "Sorry, you're really not leaving it out. You're making a very strong behavioral assumption that the contact pattern is invariant, despite prevalence of the disease." So you're including behavior one way or the other. You can't, you can't not include behavior, but you can do it badly. And maybe we can do it a tiny bit better. And here are a couple simple approaches, all extensible with students, faculty. I think there's a whole line of publications that's, that's, that's possible. And the agentization of these equations is underway and so forth. But here are a couple simple moves that introduce some behavioral components. The first I wanna talk about is coupled contagion, uh, which involves contagious disease and contagious fear of the disease and nothing about vaccine or vaccine fear. All right, and we published this in 2008. Uh, it's called Coupled Contagion Dynamics of Fear and Disease, Mathematical and Computational Explorations. And the idea, the narrative is really that there are two interacting contagion processes, one of disease, one of fear of the disease. Individuals contract disease only through contact with sick people, disease-infected people. Individuals contract fear through contact with disease-infected, the sick, fear-infected, the scared, and those infected with both fear and disease, the sick and the scared. Scared individuals, whether they're sick or not, withdraw from circulation with some probability, which suppresses the spread of the disease, right? They're, they're, they're removing fuel from the infection process. Uh, but because new cases are down, they've suppressed spread. The fear also decays and people return to circulation, often prematurely. And this pours fuel on the infective embers and a new wave explodes. So this is one kind of core narrative of the model. So disease is up, fear is up, people get out of contact, that suppresses the disease, but then they stop being afraid and then they go back into circulation, but the thing's still going on, so it blows up again. That's the story, all right? And uh, I published a couple formulations. One is differential equations. The other is an agent-based computational model. And I think the dialogue between differential equations and agent-based modeling is very interesting and, and fertile. Uh, we, we have lots of ways to agentize differential equations, adding stochasticity and space. And it often is very interesting to compare the uh, behavior of the deterministic no space ODEs with the agent-based models. And uh, I think this is a whole rich area. Uh, and you can tell how robust are the differential equations to the introduction of these things. Okay, anyway, two formulations. Here's, uh, here are the state variables. Again, we're not gonna go too far under the hood, but the idea is S, the S compartment are individuals susceptible to the pathogen and fear, infected with fear only, is I sub F. IP is infected with pathogen only. And IPF is infected with both the pathogen and fear. And you could remove yourself from circulation to the fear and you can recover and come back and all of these things. The transition probabilities, if the probability of getting sick, beta, the normal disease transmissibility is beta and the fright transmissibility is alpha, then you know the probability that you're sick and scared is this and not scared, but sick is this. This compartment in the lower left is of course the most interesting one because this is the case for prevalence independent fear contagions. Uh, so this is an important departure from the rational epidemics tradition that I'll come back and talk about where people make a utility maximizing decision conditional on prevalence of the disease. And you know we're interested in other processes like fear contagion, which is not even choice-like in my view, but we can come back to this. 
Uh, and then there are these removal parameters, right? You, you are removed uh, from infection with the pathogen at gamma two, that's just regular disease recovery. The rate at which you remove from self-isolation, uh, recovery from fear, all of these things. Uh, and in the paper, we discuss them and whether they're measurable and obviously this is empirical challenge, so forth. But here's the picture. I hate these stupid diagrams. I don't know how to read them. I don't know what the functional forms of these arrows are. So I call them Agincourt state transition diagrams because they're just a million arrows. I find it easier to look at the equations, although these look pretty horrible, but at least you can see the state variables. They're susceptible to everything, infected with fear, infected with bug, infected with both, removed from fear, and then finally removed uh, from circulation entirely at the bottom. But, you know, again, they subsume the classical picture. With alpha equals zero, that is there's with no fear transmission, you get the classical SIR model. DSDT is minus beta SI. The IDT is uh, beta SI minus gamma I. And removal is just gamma I, okay? Uh, IP for the pathogen. And similarly, with beta equals zero, no pathogen, you can still get epidemics of fear. Uh, and this again, is it's the same algebraic form. It's the SDT for fear minus alpha SI fear plus alpha SI fear in the infected compartment minus gamma one fear uh, in the removed compartment. And the two of them are happening at once. It's kind of a few of SIR models, if you like. And uh, we have the standard removal from disease back to uh, the susceptible pool and so forth. Uh, and one of the mysteries of the 1918 flu is why were there multiple waves at all? And there's always been a debate about this. Uh, one mechanism is it's a new strain like the Delta variant. There's no real uh, genomic forensics that would support that view. And we've been able to excavate a lot of samples of the 1918 flu. It's not what I do, but, uh, but there's no evidence of that. Uh, and here is a behavioral mechanism. And the, the model shows, then we publish these curves, that here's, here's, the, here's our standard, the, the, the narrative. Um, and you have susceptibles in blue at the beginning. Uh, and the red curve is, is actual disease. The blue curve is susceptible to disease. It falls as the red curve rises because people are transferring into the infected pool. But as the infection curve goes up, so does fear. And when fear goes up, people start to isolate. And because they're isolating, it suppresses the spread of the disease. You're withdrawing fuel from this reaction. And then the level of disease gets very low. But now people aren't afraid anymore and they come out of their basement and they pour susceptibles onto the still circulating infected, even though they're low. And this produces another wave. And this is a very simple way of getting multiple waves where the classical equations don't by introducing a simple form of behavioral adaptation. And this is, again, you know, in very crude qualitative agreement with what happened in 1980. Here it's multiple waves in the UK and Wales. Here are multiple waves in the US cities. So I was emboldened by this and conducted an absolutely massive big data, huge data analysis of Chicago, I read two newspapers from that time. And uh, this is a characteristic sequence of events. Here's Chicago, which is dark blue. And uh, as the thing took off, John Robertson, commissioner of health said, go home and go to bed until you're better. He took everybody out of circulation, theaters closed, stadiums closed, everybody just stopped moving around. And this indeed suppressed the spread of the disease. And at which point he happily reported, we're practically out of the woods, all bands are off. In a few days, I'm sure Chicago will be the healthiest city in the world. And he was right, you were practically out of the woods. The problem is it only takes a few cases for the thing to reignite, which is what it did. All right, so again, on, on, my, on my deep empirical, and, and then now Neil Ferguson and uh, 
and, and Bootsman and Ferguson did a thorough analysis of this for each city. And this was a very characteristic pattern. Uh, so, you know, Einstein said theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And uh, my attitude about massive data mining is that the data should be as big as necessary, but no bigger. Um, all right, and you can compute things like the bug can dissipate before the infection does. Fear can transmit faster than the bug itself, even if the two transmission rates are equal, because there's more transmission channels. There's more ways to catch fear than there are to catch the bug. And of course, the fear doesn't require physical contact. Fear goes faster than the bug under this parameter relationship. And there are lots of other things published in the article about this approach. All right. Uh, now, fear, of course, can stimulate people to leave even when there's no disease. And a good example is uh, Surat, India in 94. You know, a few hundred thousand people fled the city uh, out of fear of pneumonic plague. And, you know, the, the World Health Organization was really unable to establish any cases after the fact. Uh, so, you know, you, it can be mostly fear. And uh, flight, of course, is good for the people who flee, but they can also spread the disease spatially. And here, a nice agent-based model is useful. Although uh, J.D. Murray's book, Mathematical Biology, has a nice reaction diffusion model also uh, for the Black Plague in Europe. So, you know, reaction diffusion equations are a nice sort of midpoint between uh, deterministic ODEs and full up agent based models that are also very interesting. So, there's lots of ways to do this work. Uh, the agent based model just had agents with different color codings and the same transmission rules. And if people don't flee, you get the above sort of picture with infected contained. And if people do flee, then they spread the thing to other parts of the landscape. And you can study all of this and even try to calibrate it to the spatial spread of diseases uh, using actual data. I, I don't mean to disparage real data. We spend a lot of time trying to calibrate these models. But among friends, <laughs> I can say, I just read a couple of newspapers, especially mathematical friends. Uh, all right, so distancing is two-edged. It doesn't always depress the epidemic. It can spread it to other parts of the world. Uh, all right, and we discussed some very rudimentary behaviors. Uh, we had the bug and fear of the bug. Uh, we can also have fear of the control, which is a two fear model where there's contagious disease, there's contagious fear of the disease, and there's contagious fear of the control measure, which we think of as the vaccine. And vaccine refusal is a huge deal. I mean, WHO now lists vaccine refusal as one of the top 10 threats to global health. And it's responsible for the surgeons of polio, pertussis, measles, and COVID-19, of course. So now let's, uh, measles, for example, you know, very highly contagious disease. There's fear of measles, which I think is legitimate. It, it kills children at some, at some level. Uh, and there's fear of the measles vaccine, which is not legitimate, but the dynamics of the disease depend on the relationship between the transmission of the disease the fear of the disease and the fear of the vaccine. And generally this model that I'm about to show you is really about cycles of vigilance and complacency that I think are ubiquitous, uh, obviously in the case of disease research, but also in, in areas like financial panic, I'm doing quite a lot of work with the new, uh, the, the new approaches to economic challenges group at the OECD, who I know some of you are familiar with, uh, on sort of speculative bubbles and crashes and how those contribute to the same sorts of mechanisms. But there are many others uh, where you have a cycle of vigilance and complacency. And in the history of diseases, it's, it's a very important phenomenon. Uh, smallpox, for example, uh, is one of the great, great scourges of history, it kills about 30% of those infected. And even when inoculated, uh, when, when the inoculation was discovered by Jenner, uh, cycles of vigilance and complacency kept the damn thing alive. And there's a wonderful social history of uh, smallpox by Jennifer Lee Carroll called The Speckled Monster, where she writes, in London, inoculations popularity waxed and waned through the 1730s with the force of the disease. In bad years, people flocked to be inoculated. In lighter years, the practice shrank. Inoculation was a security, the only security to cling to 
within the terror of an epidemic. In times of good health, however, it looked like a foolish flirtation with danger. All right, and this is the type of problem we're interested in in this uh, paper of ours, where uh, in this case in smallpox, she's talking about two fears. There's fear of smallpox, which in bad years made people get vaccinated. But when there's not much smallpox, the fear of the vaccine, hesitance about the vaccine dominates and people stop. But then the thing comes back. This is the picture we're after in our model in this case. And my co-authors here are Erez Hatna of uh, you know, my, my department and, and lab and uh, Jennifer Crodell, who was a postdoc at Courant when we did this work and is now at Middlebury. Um, so let me tell you first the wrong model that I think is the right idea. Uh, then I'll tell you the, I mean, I'm not saying we have the right model, but I'm saying we have a slightly better model, but this is, this is the idea that involves these two fears and the balance between them. So we imagine some threat, you know, disease, T of T, and some control, V of T, and there's a constant for the moment, fear of the threat, and a constant fear of the control. So if the, if the fear of the threat exceeds the fear of the control, then if the threat increases, the vaccination rate increases. But when the vaccination rate increases by equation two, the threat, the threat growth rate falls, all right? So again, I don't know how many people in the audience are students or already professional, but uh, so I gauge this towards students, but in any event, it's clear that if you differentiate the P equation, you get this picture uh, and it's basically, you know, d squared t dt squared is minus kt. And does that remind anyone of anything? We're interested in cycles. What is that equation? Simple harmonic. Exactly right, it's Hooke's law, right? So you get Hooke's law, simple harmonic motion, and, of, and less than zero, if the vaccine fear exceeds the threat fear, you get exponential growth of the disease. And obviously when they're equal, it's a tipping point of the dynamics. And you can throw in other wrinkles. So I say, this is the right idea. It's not, not the model we really have in mind. But if I were teaching this, I'd start there. I'd say, look, let's just think about this with constants. And there's a difference between the fears and we're interested in cycles. So lo and behold, a very simple setup produces that. If there's, if there's fatigue that you get sick of taking vaccine or something, then you have you know, a spiral sink instead of a neutral center. And you get the same sort of damped oscillations as in the 1918 cities. And if you like, you can add seasonal forcings like this. And then you can even get, you could think of maybe pandemics are kind of like resonance catastrophes, right? You have an, an endogenous uh, forcing, uh, an endogenous cyclical phenomenon forced by another oscillator. And when they entrain, the thing is very bad. And uh, Cy Levin and uh, David Earn and Josh Plotkin published a paper in PNAS that's not, has no behavior, uh, but is quite interesting along these lines. So there are a lot of games you can play with the simple model and they might give you some insight again. Uh, now the, I'm not, the right model is not, of course, that's inappropriate. I mean, can we do a little better? And mainly the idea is, uh, yes, we like the difference between fears, but the fears should be dynamic and they should change endogenously, and perhaps they should even be contagious. Uh, the other problem with that little toy model is there's no real epidemiology. You've just got the threat and the vaccine, but you have no mechanism for the threat to be growing through its own spread. So let's, let's jazz this up and try to get in the right ballpark. Uh, so we're gonna have disease. We're gonna have fear of disease like before. We're gonna have fear of disease and vaccine. And we're gonna have fear of disease and vaccine and fear of vaccine. And we're gonna require a little more notation so that now capital S, wherever you see it means the individual is susceptible to disease or it's the compartment of individuals susceptible to disease. S sub FD is susceptible to disease and afraid of catching the disease. And S F V is susceptible to disease and afraid of the vaccine. And you know, again, the narrative is kind of, is quite related. The cycle depends on the balance between fear of disease, SFD, and fear of the vaccine, SFV. But both of those are dynamic. 
When the fear of disease exceeds the fear of vaccine, people accept the vaccine, but that can suppress transmission and new cases fall. Now people are less afraid of the disease than the vaccine. People refuse vaccine and the thing roars back. And we've talked about smallpox, but it's the same idea. Only now it looks like this, DVDT is roughly a constant times the difference between the fears, both of which are dynamic. And again, equality is a tipping point of the dynamics. So here's another horrible diagram. And then a little bit about the state variables in this case. Again, the S's we've discussed, infected with the pathogen I of T, we're now fear here is fear of catching the disease. So if you've already got the disease, you have, we assume you have no fear of catching it. Uh, on the right, there are three betas, one for each contagion. And there are two mechanisms of fear decay. One is stimulus deprivation that I can talk about, uh, the neuroscience of that. And the other is uh, the idea that you become less afraid if you contact somebody who's less afraid. There's some kind of complacency contagion or so forth, right? And again, here are the equations. They're quite different than the others in some respects, but very similar in that, uh, you know, again, with no fear, it reduces to the classical SIR picture. Uh, vaccinees leave the susceptible SFD is susceptible to disease and afraid of the and afraid of the disease. But as you're vaccinated, you you leave that pool. Uh, the core idea remains the same. SFD minus SFV in the bottom is driving things, but it needs to be scaled. Uh, properly. Um, all right, and, and here, contagious fear decay really controls the size of these subsequent waves, which can actually be bigger than the first wave. So here's high fear decay. People prematurely abandon distancing, and you get this massive second wave, bigger than the first. All right, and that's an interesting thing. You can also get waves that are smaller than the first, later than the first, and the whole pace and shape of these things depends on this parameter, of course, all others as well. Uh, and another mechanism for waves, so this is the mechanism before, premature decay of fear of the disease, but another is adverse vaccine events and vaccine refusal. And you may recall that early in the, earlier in the COVID pandemic, some reactions to the J&J &J vaccine led to a complete suspension of vaccination and to subsequent waves. I mean, I, the, the data, I didn't bother to collect a thousand pictures of COVID-19 multiple waves, but it, we're all familiar with them. And uh, one mechanism is this, is this vaccine refusal, which I, is a huge problem, I think. Anyway, even rare adverse events can lead to contagions of vaccine fear and vaccine refusal and multiple waves. And I hope to have time to show you something about the neuroscience of fear learning which really shows that surprise is essential to these dynamics. It's essential if you want a fear spike, spike, the adverse event needs to be surprising. We'll come back to this, I hope, if we have time. So it's good not to pretend that vaccines are riskless. And it's the same with speculative bubbles in this OECD work. I mean, you have expectations of high returns. So when something fails, it's a shock and that produces a fear spike that can spread and lead to a financial panic, which we also are studying. Okay, um, but again, here's, here's this excursion. Uh, high adverse event rates, people abandon vaccine in en masse, and you get, again, an enormous subsequent wave, but even low vaccine rates can propagate and uh, catalyze second waves as well. Okay, so these are all qualitative exercises. Uh, and we have lots of plans to scale this up. I have a big grant in with, with Courant and Johns Hopkins for large scale cognitive epidemiology. Uh, and we wanna populate very large national planetary scale models with cognitively plausible adaptive agents. And if I have a minute, why don't I talk about those? Is that okay, Tom, or should I just, Wrap up. Yeah, that would be my first follow-up question. Okay, what good. Is cognitive agents. <laughs> All right, great. So, this is about a larger agenda, a larger social science agenda, where the idea is: look, what do you mean by an explanation of a macroscopic regularity like a wealth distribution, an epidemic, 
trajectory, a well, you know, a segregation pattern. And to me, and agent-based modeling now is like you want to demonstrate how that pattern could emerge in a population of cognitively plausible agents, right? Does the micro world, little m, generate the macroscopic explanandum, segregation, wealth, what have you? So little m, is if it does do that, then M is a generative explanatory candidate. And the motto is, you know, if you didn't grow it, you didn't explain it. Not the converse. We're not saying any old way of growing things is explanatory and it might not be unique. Uh, that you're able to do it from the micro world of agents is a, is, a, is a necessary but not sufficient condition. But it's a very different picture of explanation than in game theory and economics where you say, I've got the pattern. How do I explain it? show that it's the Nash equilibrium of a game or furnish a functional with respect to which the trajectory is some extremal or furnish a regression relating aggregate variables. It's a different picture. It's a bottom up picture where you try to generate these patterns in micro worlds of agents and they need to be cognitively plausible, not in my view, like the rational actor. Uh, okay, so what are some necessary constituents of a cognitively plausible agent. I think they have emotions and agent zero has, has fear. They have bounded deliberative capacity. They make a whole rack of well-documented errors that Kahneman, Tversky, Herb Simon, a million people have now documented very compellingly. And they're connected to other agents who are emotionally driven, statistically hobbled and so forth. And all of those enter into their behavior. And one candidate is this creature I published called agent zero toward neurocognitive foundations for generative social science. Uh, and then there's several subsequent publications. But the idea is this agent is endowed with distinct affective, deliberative, and social modules, each of which is a real valued function defined on a stochastic stimulus landscape. But each one of them has a basis in contemporary cognitive neuroscience. The internal modules interact to produce observable individual behavior. And when you put a bunch of these creatures together and let them interact, they do generate a wide variety of collective dynamics, certainly in health, but also conflict. They generate their own networks, economic dynamics, even some interesting parables about, about jury behavior. And the idea of that work is to get the synthesis started. It's all very provisional, but it's also formal. I mean, there's lots of criticism of the rational actor of economics and game theory. There's even a field in that tradition called rational epidemics, which is elegant and in some cases useful. Uh, but again, there's a lot of criticism of the rational actor, but counterexamples, gripes, uh, even decisive falsifying experiments don't really change scientific practice. You have to have explicit formal alternatives. And although provisional, agent zero is one, uh, and it, I, produced, I published mathematical and again, agent-based versions of it. And we wanna populate large scale models uh, using this agent. Uh, one of these is the national scale model that we've published. Again, this is about 300 million individuals. This is an H1N1 run we did for NIH where things start in Los Angeles, black, healthy, red, sick, blue, recovered. And it has all travel from zip code to zip code in the United States uh, and it's a very detailed model of contact dynamics at that level. And we have even larger models that are planetary in scale, also done for NIH, where same color, black, healthy, red, sick, blue, recovered. And this is a case of H1. This was a, a study we did on what if a novel bird flu emerges in Asia? Should you A, send all your antivirals there to clamp it? Or do you withhold, withhold all your antivirals for the United States unless it, until it, if it goes global? So you can't really answer that question without a model and we've built this and, and also published this. So this is the type of model we wanna populate with agent zero. But if I have a minute, maybe I should say just the tiniest bit more about that agent. Uh, why don't I, I think the way to do this is to, is to tell you the idea. Uh, and I, one way to communicate the idea is to imagine a sort of combat interpretation where three agents of this type, agent zero, occupy some land. This agent in the lower left never moves. These agents do move around an area of the world where they're subject to attacks, these orange illuminations. They are doing several things. 
One, their fear conditioning on these trials in a way that I'll describe. This is classical fear conditioning for which we have very good, but you know, primitive, but good equations. And they're learning to fear yellow sites because they're associating them with these adverse attacks by indigenous yellow agents. They turn orange, they attack, and this produces an association between yellow agents and an attack. And they become afraid without calculating anything. They become conditioned to fear indigenous sites. They're also making a crude computation of the relative frequency of ambushers uh, in their radius, their sampling radius in the yellow uh, environment. So they're saying, you know, five out of 10 of these people blow up on me. So I'm gonna say there's a chance of 0.5 that a randomly selected yellow will ambush me. And they're in communication with one another. They have their dispositions to retaliate are also communicated by weights. And when their disposition to retaliate exceeds a threshold, they blow up their sites. But what's interesting is this agent also blows up his site, even though he's never been subject to any attack. So if the sampling radius is, for example, their von Neumann neighborhood, this person never encounters any bad experience with anybody, but he blows up his village anyhow. And that's a phenomenon we care about. Here's one eye candy run. This is of course one sample path of a stochastic process, but it shows the kind of result you get. And he blows up his village, all right? So the setup is action is binary. It could be refuse vaccine or flee the snake. Uh, and there's some threshold. Agents have affective and deliberative functions bounded, on, bounded to zero one. And for the moment, it's just their disposition to retaliate is the sum of their passion and their reason to sound a little like Hume. All right, so the soul, but they also weigh the solo dispositions of others. So their total disposition to retaliate is their solo disposition plus the sum of weighted dispositions of others. And if you take out the threshold, then it's just you act if your net disposition is positive. Under the hood, we have this master equation, but the V of T equation is a variation on the Rescorla-Wagner model, which is very well established on fear conditioning. And it's just got, I collapse all this into a single parameter for most of the book. So there's one parameter there. And I'll show you the neuroscience of this. Then there's this relative frequency with some little memory. So they have a moving average of relative frequencies. Memory is another parameter. And the weights in this model are endogenous. It's a kind of strength scaled affective homophily that determines how, whether you are, you know, whether you uh, weigh the other person heavily or not. Uh, and again, it's the differential equations version looks like this. But let me talk a tiny bit about the neuroscience part of it. Uh, you know, we toss the word fear around a lot in the coupled contagion modeling. Can we, can we really talk about that, give, take that more seriously now? Uh, and the fear instantiation, uh, we care about fear acquisition and fear extinction. All right, so let me talk about a little neuroscience of fear. The, the simplest example of fear learning is a conditioning experiment like this. I put a shock cuff on, on Tom Hurd uh, and I shock him. His amygdala recruits blood. It sets off a whole chain of reactions. You freeze, there are electrodermal phenomena, all sorts of adrenal spikes, lots of things happen when I give Tom an unexpected shock. And many of these are recorded by amygdalar excitation. And this is an fMRI. The lower thing is blood recruitment to the amygdala. All right, by contrast, if I show Tom a blue light, nothing happens. There's no recruitment to the amygdala of anything. But if I start pairing them, blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock, then I show the blue light alone and I get this amygdala response. Tom's been conditioned to expect the shock when given the blue light, and the blue light alone can elicit the shock, elicit the, uh, the, the fear, okay? And there's a simple model of this that's been published and many, many elaborations. And, you know, again, my idea was get the synthesis started. The modules obviously can be deepened, improved, elaborated, and so forth. But I thought, what's the simplest equation I can plug into this silly agent and get some fear dynamics out? And this is the picture. It's the, the, the associative gain is a constant times 
the maximum association minus the current association, okay? And it's just concave down with an asymptote of lambda, which is assumed to be one. So that's the fear module. And of course, Joe Ledoux at NYU has done a lot on this. And, uh, you know, this is something that's, that's, uh, that you see in all, all vertebrates. And I'm not gonna stop to say that, it, that it's good in some ways, but bad in others. I mean, it's good that it protects you from charging hippos and BMWs whipping around the corner, uh, but it's also dangerous and that it makes you vulnerable to nefarious associations or, or bad ones like MMR vaccine and autism or, you know, these other sorts of things, okay? Um, the, the, the fear extinction equation is produced by just setting lambda equal to zero. So when the shocks stop, lambda goes to zero and it's negative exponential decay, right? So this is the whole trajectory. You get this acquisition curve a la Riscola-Wagner and if the stimulus stops, you get decay like this. And this is what we see in lots and lots of laboratory results. Uh, this is an example in, in, in rats. Uh, and I often say, you know, we don't fear what the rat fears, but we fear how the rat fears. And if you're interested in the complete trajectory in heavy side step functions, which is that. Uh, all right, so one component is fear, but we're saying it's contagious. A couple of contagion models show that it's a fruitful hypothesis, but I mean, is there any neural basis? Are you licensed to assume, assume it's contagious? And again, here's another nice little example. Here's our Tom Hurd experiment. Blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock, and blue light alone, this is this. But a very nice experiment concerns an observer of that conditioning experiment. The observer doesn't get shocked at all. He just watches Tom endure the blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock, and then he's shown the blue light and his amygdala lights up, even though he's never had a shock in his life. So that's a great thing evolutionarily, right? Because I learned to fear the stove by watching Tom get burned on the stove. But I also can acquire all sorts of stupid fears from Tom, like fears, of, uh, you know, baseless fears. All right, so one ingredient is emotion. That's in this equation, in that, in that, that's in the agent in that form. But, you know, reason is a slave to the passions, as Hume said, but reason does happen. It's just very, very bad. There are a million documented errors of how people mess up the rational calculation. Their departures from the rational act are very well established in this literature. Prospect theory for which uh, Dan Kahneman won a Nobel Prize is a very kind of complete alternative of this. But Agent Zero tries to incorporate some of these departures and he's a local relative frequentist and he exhibits several of these well-established uh, errors in his deliberation module, right? The first module is non-deliberative at all. I don't think you're choosing to be afraid of the snake. I throw the snake in your lap, you freeze. It's not a choice at all. This module is choice-like and deliberative and depends on data, although the data is manipulated badly, all right? And they're driven by other agents who are statistically crippled and emotionally driven. And there's conformity effects that are also documented in many spheres. And the book talks a lot about the neuroscience of conformity where people have published work showing that uh, rejection illicit, illumin, you know, it recruits the same centers of the brain as are associated with literal physical pain. So there's a, a whole paper by Ethan Cross and others talking about rejection really does hurt. So you give others weight, you don't like to be conformity, uh, has this advantage, it's pain avoiding, all right? And there are weights that we can talk about, but the logic of the model is you form a disposition to retaliate based on these threats. If the disposition exceeds the threshold you act, that of course alters the stimulus pattern which feeds back to change the dispositions and the environment and the agents are coupled. Everything's in the book and the Princeton website. So it's, it may be baloney, but it's replicable baloney. Let me just show you some of the runs and then I'll stop. We saw this one where the agent uh, joins without any direct stimulus. Again, he's fear conditioning, making bad statistics, communicating his disposition to others. This guy blows up his village. Uh, and why does that happen? It's because the threshold, he doesn't go alone because the threshold exceeds his solo disposition, but he goes in the group because the total disposition does exceed his threshold, right? So despite being negatively disposed, uh, 
he goes. And what's more interesting, he can even go first where he would never go alone. This is my favorite run, I think. Uh, here he initiates the attacks, even though he's never been subject to any adverse stimulus. Okay, so is he a leader or is he just the most susceptible to dispositional contagion? And Tolstoy's answer is, a king is history's slave performing for the swarm life, which is my attitude also. They can flee diseases if instead of retaliating, here's this recalcitrant guy who wouldn't go alone, but other agents are afraid of this reactor meltdown or disease or whatever, then they can leave and so on. Uh, and there are many extensions to scale up to large numbers, permit arbitrary networks. Obviously the net, the first actor is interesting. Uh, we've studying how robust is that. Uh, you can add lots of networks with an agent provocateur like this. You can add other, you can select your own network uh, distributions, degree distributions. And here's a nice little movie of these two agent provocateurs stimulate all these people to dump their stocks or retaliate against their villages or refuse vaccine, even though none of them have experienced anything bad and their dispositions are uh, the vertical distances. All right, and let me just finish by saying that, that you know, as a matter of kind of general, the general picture I think is, I say, the overall picture reflected in these interpretations of Agent Hero is unsettling. Here we have a creature evolved that is selected for high susceptibility to unconscious fear conditioning. Fear, conscious or otherwise, can be acquired rapidly through direct exposure or indirectly through fearful others. This primal emotion is moderated by a more recently evolved deliberative module, which at best operates suboptimally on incomplete data and whose risk appraisals are normally biased further by affect itself. Both Affective and cognitive modules, moreover, are powerfully influenced by the dispositions of similar, equally limited and unconsciously driven agents. Is it any wonder that collectivities of interacting agents of this type, the agent zero type, can exhibit mass violence, dysfunctional health behaviors, and financial panic? And on that happy note, I will conclude and welcome questions, criticisms, and, uh, and any other reactions you may have. Well, thank you, Josh. That was uh, brilliant. Um, Thanks. Uh, so um, I know um, there, there are often are questions in the chat. I think Jonathan Dushoff asked a question, but maybe um, Jonathan, do you have a, a real question you'd like to ask? <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I don't know what you're referring to in, in the chat. Um, oh, it's just a question. You about mentioned, a slide. I see. Um, so you mentioned that your models with, uh, even in very simple models, you have fear decay leading to second waves that are larger than the first. And you said right. that was interesting. And I certainly found it interesting. I mean, we expect right. fear to have accumulated. We expect susceptibles to have accumulated. In some of these models, we expect vaccines to have accumulated. So can you give us insight into that mechanism, why the second wave could be larger? Yeah, I mean, I, for example, it could be that the thing starts out at some level, it's uh, surprising, salient, people are scared and they go into the basement. Meanwhile, while they're in the basement, the infected pool is still growing. And when they come out of the basement, they're dumping susceptible susceptibles on a larger infected base than there was before they went to the basement and you get a bigger second wave. That's one story, I would say. So the, so the Fear is going down even as the infection is going up. That's what we're assuming. Your direct exposure is 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 zero, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it doesn't sound. No, I mean, you, I, it hang on, hang on. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I think I misspoke. My apologies. New cases are falling because susceptibles are being removed. So the overall mm -hmm. prevalence is increasing, but the rate of growth is not as high. And the fear decays because new cases aren't happening. Then when they come out of the basement, there's a lot of infective fuel and the thing blows up again. Okay. Does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah. So basically it's because you're basing it on, on rates of change rather yes. than on numbers. 
Yes. Yeah, that, 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 that's the answer that I missed. Thanks. Exactly right. I hope you um, saw that I cited your very nice paper with uh, Cy and uh, Josh. I, I did see that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the reason I wanted to speak is so, you know, I would acknowledge that I'm here listening. Yeah, Thanks well, I wanted to, and I have uh, admired your work for a long time, so keep going. It's anyway, nice, it's please. nice of you to say. Uh, not at all. Um, are, if there's no other hand, Tom, I see a hand, hand from. I see oh, a okay. hand from someone. I'll, I'll get at the end of the line then. Okay, Jian Hong. It, it's my hand, but I raised ask pretty much the same question in oh. Jonathan about the so how the really how fear is conditioned to what is it to prevalence or to change of prevalence. Um, and also, uh, it's at a different stage of outer break. The, the, the relationship seems to be, would be different because uh, when the disease declines, uh, how yes. the fear is. So, um, so, so, so uh, you, you mentioned you read the Chicago newspaper. I just wonder how, if, if you find anything from those newspaper and the cases. <laughs> I don't know. The, I don't know. I just, uh, well, on the second point, you know, Neil Putma and, uh, and Ferguson, Neil Ferguson did a very nice paper in the, in the proceedings of the National Academy where they really went through this agony of excavating all these city behaviors. And, uh, you know, this is really the, the pattern. It may have been that there was a contagion among the mayors to behave this way, I don't know, but, but uh, this is what happened in, the, in these cities. And, and, you know, they didn't have the Kermack mckendrick equations. They didn't have any real insight into the threshold, you know, nature of epidemics or herd immunity of all these other things. And naturally they thought, eh, you know, it's almost gone, let's, let's go back. And then the thing blows up, which of course is this, you know, happening in the United States all the time now in different sex, sections of the United States. And, and I'm sure it's, it's a serious threat all over the world where vaccination is very low level. I mean, on a planetary scale, there's very little vaccination. Uh, anyway, okay, now the first question was what happens when there's fear contagion? The main response is to remove yourself from circulation. You're susceptible, but you're afraid of catching the disease. And as the disease growth rate, the new cases climbs, you are leaving uh, the, the pool of uh, circulating susceptible people. So that's removing fuel from the epidemic and suppressing the spread. And as the spread rate starts to fall, your fear starts to fall with it. And you say, eh, you know, it's getting better. I'm not so worried. And I come out of my isolation and I return to circulation. But unfortunately, the thing is still moving around and I can get the disease. And because of this r not phenomenon, I can give it to others and they can give it to others and the thing can cascade forward in this way. So that's, that's why fear matters. It's not fear is actually a good thing. It's the decay of fear that produces this problem. Fear is a bad thing in the case of vaccine, but it's a good thing in the case of this. I think a relevant question is the time scale in, in the uh, Spanish flu time, the, hmm. I assume this, the, the fear spread much slower than the fear uh, spread nowadays. Would right. that make any difference? It would, you know, first of all, yes. I mean, it certainly would make a difference. And, and, uh, and again, I don't claim to have calibrated the Royal mm -hmm. Society paper, although we have a big other project trying to do this using Twitter mining for fear, geolocated cell phone data for how people move around, case data, and we've made a good attempt to generate the multiple waves of New York State this way and hope to publish that. So there is an effort to calibrate that model. The 1918 flu, I mean, most of the spread was in the trenches of World War I, where flight was really not an option. Uh, so it's not the best experiment, I don't think. Although there were parts of the United States very colorful in, if you read the Bootsma Ferguson article, you know, where there were armed, you know, armed citizens preventing uh, ships from landing from infected parts of the world and all kinds of crazy stories about how people responded to fear by blocking the importation of the disease or through isolation 
of their villages and quarantines and, and so forth. So the, the reactions in 1918 were very, very uh, diverse, uh, but I think the European uh, epidemic was just incredibly explosive precisely because good mixing was enforced. I mean, you were in a war, you're not allowed to just leave because you're afraid. So that, so that behavioral adaptation was really blocked in that part of the 1918 uh, experience. Um, so Jake Duty, do you wanna ask a question? Uh, sure, can you hear me? Yep. Great, uh, I'm an undergraduate from UMBC, so I apologize if this is a very silly question. But Don't ever apologize, you're learning, that's great. <laughs> so there's no, there's no bad question, there's only bad answers. So I guess my question is if, hmm, wouldn't the fear that you're working with here that you're like predicting and that is part of your model, isn't mm -hmm. that in some ways a fallout of the model itself? In that if a lot of papers use a fear-based model and then they predict something happening and they say that, for example, things are going to be very bad, then wouldn't that be one of the things that determines how much fear there is from the get-go? Isn't this self-referential? Does the model have to take into account itself? Well, I mean, would that that were the case, but I think so few people read our papers that the uh, hypothesis is very generous about the impact of modeling. Although in economics, there's something called the Lucas critique that first of all, it's a very insightful and interesting question. Uh, in the case of economics, there's a whole literature about this, that predictions of panic produce panic uh, and so forth. So I think it's a very interesting question, Jake, uh, I think in this case, again, I just, I, I, I'd like to think that so many people read our papers that, uh, you know, that, that, that this would be a problem. Um, I also, but if, but if everybody did read the paper, they'd also learn, look, I mean, I think the policy implication is don't, don't minimize, entertain failure and tell people, look, this vaccine isn't perfectly safe. That disarms the fear response, and that's also something we've we've published that I didn't I didn't talk about today. But I mean, maybe it bears on your on your question that you know if you tell people, look, there will be adverse events to this vaccine. Then, when there are adverse events, it doesn't produce this crazy fear spike and a whole cascade of vaccine refusal. Um, anyway, I apologize. It's probably a big evasive answer to your to your question, but I hope it I hope it. I hope it helps a little. Feel free to follow up. You have my email. Sounds good. Thanks. Sure. Okay, I'm going to just jump in here to sort of oversee the process. I know we're well after the official end. So I'd like to thank you officially for, for both the talk and the questions, but I'd also like to invite you to continue. Sure, <laughs> and I'm happy to. Anybody, and anybody who would like to hang around for a few more minutes to continue, um, that would be great. Um, but let's thank uh, Josh officially. <laughs> and, uh, My pleasure. And, My pleasure. And, and people who need to leave, um, thank you for joining. And um, so I see uh, Martin Grunhill has a, a question. Sure. I thought Jonathan Dushoff was first. Oh, no. Well, he put up his hand after you. He's just above you alphabetically. <laughs> he never lowered his hand. So. No, I think you may have just kept his hand up, but that's fine. Okay. I, I, no, I, no, I'm, I'm, I said I could go at the end if there were I'm no sure more questions, first, but, this, first, first. I, but this, is, this isn't the end. You have a question. I already asked yeah, one. Very, very I, welcome. I, okay. I'll just quickly go then. It was basically one thing that I thought was possibly missing from the sort of fear compartment, as it will. Um, they're still in one sense susceptible because there will be a very limited number of contacts, even at the height of the pandemic, you still have, or any lockdown, you still have a number of people who are say in an actual lockdown, all they've done is re reduced their contacts. They haven't completely eliminated it. Right. And I was just wondering if there was a way to capture that in the model, because I think you may end up where you had that upswing, which was greater than the original one that right. could actually force that issue. Very, very nice point. Very good observation. The two models I showed are different in exactly that respect. One of them is a binary, you remove yourself from, from uh, in circulation. And in the, the second, the Royal Society paper, uh, you are removing yourself 
with some probability. So it's true, you don't, you, that, that you can choose uh, that probability from some distribution. And it's not the case that everybody afraid disappears. They reduce their contact rate proportional to their fear or as a function of their fear. All right, so a nice point, And I think we tried to address it a little bit in the Royal Society paper where the fear produces a, a reduction in your contact. It reduces your effective contact rate. It doesn't remove you from circulation as a, as a binary matter. The removed individuals are not a, are a they're not they're not really a separate compartment here. Um, okay, I wonder if it's the case that that's kind of fueling that uh, dramatic upswing that can go past the initial wave. I'm just sure it's, it's probably impossible to track, but I just have a weird kind of idea that you know where you've got those uh, like that slide you're just showing there. Yeah, where you've got that. I'm wondering if that because you've effectively got a slow burning pandemic and it's seeding it slightly in the population. Yeah, with very I mean, few people. And then all of a sudden that means that you're effectively, you're, you're seeding it a bit more widely, but at a slow rate. So when you do start the, everything off again, that's what start, makes the boom even quicker, uh, the, I, go even greater. I, you look, I mean, I don't know. It could be, it's a very good question to do a much, much more thorough analysis. Again, here, what's driving the waves is not the, not the fear, but the fear decay, right? I mean, it's not, I mean, the, the, obviously they're related. If you decay from a low level of fear, it's very different than decaying from a high level of fear. But I think it's, I think you're asking a good question worth, worth real study, but I suspect it involves both the fear acquisition, this, this row in the equations where you do, the rate at which you reduce your contacts as a function of prevalence, but also this decay rate. Uh, and, and we were mostly interested in how the high decay rate produces the second wave. But of course, it's only happening at a time when the first uh, fear dynamic you mentioned has unfolded. So yeah, I think there's a good question here. And again, follow up. We can share our MATLAB code and whatever you like. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Good, question. Good, Good question. Good question. Can I just jump in before Jonathan gets in? Um, he's got his hand up, but um, I'm really keen on the fear um, aspect, which the propagation of fear in the modern world is um, incredibly studied, you know, it's sort of transmission of ideas and memes across the internet rather than, you know, people coughing mm -hmm. and people's faces and so you must be um very thought a lot about the the impact of the internet on on fear contagion i wonder do you have any sort of general thoughts on the way um we all it, it looks like fear and, and ideas like that can dominate over every possible phys physical or biological mechanism somehow the internet trumps everything in this in this kind of in so in society now <laughs> is that well i mean that's a, yeah yeah i mean that's a good question it's obviously a huge a huge uh, medium for fear transmission so I wonder what the best sort of mathematical framework is for basically a, this completely connected world that we're in where geography doesn't seem to matter much. Right. Well, geography, this is, this is a very, Tom, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Just saying it's, I agree with you. I mean, it, the physical proximity is important for the disease transmission, but it's completely unnecessary for the fear transmission. And the fear transmission, of course, exploits all this connectivity on the internet. Uh, but I am interested in trying to get, I mean, and we're using a lot of, you know, data mining. We are doing data work on the transmission of attitudes over the internet and Twitter mining and all these other filtering Twitter and classifying messages and all sorts of horrible empirical stuff. But, but it's, it's, it's possible to do that, that work and to connect it with how people behave, connect their mobility uh, that you know, you have some fear is spreading as measured in this crude way, and then you can see changes in mobility. People stop moving around; they stop going out, and we have some data from geolocated cell phones that allow you to do that. I think, but but I do think those are kind of 
those are targets of the model. Those are outputs of the model that you'd like to generate in populations of agents that have this underlying cognitive apparatus. Like what, what did they become afraid of in the first place? And how afraid do they get? And you know, what if we could get all those all those mechanisms are there. And but again, I think they allow us to calibrate the model. They give us outputs, they give us targets for the model output. The model output we want to be generating from agents that have some actual neurocognitive apparatus of fear and of fear contagion and of conformity and so on. So, I mean, I think that's the role they can play. They can help us calibrate the models and sort of are the models producing realistic transmissions? Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you, we, can, we can track it independent of the generators, but I think the, the, the brass ring would be, can you build agents that help you explain why the fear is happening and how it's being transmitted, not just the medium over which it's being transported, you know? Right, right, right. Not just the medium, it's also, yeah, the, the yeah, right. hard wiring cognitively. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, something something right. like that. Yeah. That's it. That, that's but it's good. a but it's a it's a watershed in the data we have. I mean, it's a big deal to have all these data now that would let you use that the, they give you, they furnish a real empirical target. You know, that that's that's a big, big advance. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm wondering about here. I sort of think of geography as, you know, the Euclidean metric with, you know, social, you know, there, there yeah. should be a metric in the internet that's, you know, the degree of, of oh, associativity between different agents. How close are they in, in internet right, right. space? Totally. Um, is, is, I guess it's a- That's a big, that's a big area. I mean, there's it's all this a big work area, on. but I guess I, I, I personally, I'm, a, I'm kind of new to agent-based modeling yeah, yeah, yeah. practitioner. So, but it would yeah. be an interesting thing. Yeah. Well, and, there's this whole all, a long-standing interest in this question of you know you've got some sprawling network, and you know what is it? Can you have a few links that nonetheless produce global you know exposure? And I mean, there's this seminal paper by Watts and Strogatz about small world networks that explores this. But there's earlier work by Granovetter that like a few weak ties can ramify into a giant, you know, big spread. I mean, it's a very good question, Tom. And I don't think that anybody would say they have the right answer, but there's a whole area of work on how much connectivity is really enough to have the thing spread given you know, network structure. There's much less, on, but most of the work, and there's a whole percolation theoretic literature really dominated by Mark Newman, a physicist, on the mathematical analysis of epidemics on networks or propagation of signals on networks. Um, there's very little on networks that change. Most of those results uh, assume a fixed network uh, topology and then yeah. prove theorems about it. And I'm trying to do something a little, a little worse, uh, which is to have the networks emerge on their own right somehow mm -hmm. through homophily. And there's also work on that. So I don't know. They're all good questions, wide open. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. Unfortunately, Jonathan, I think I was I I, I unfortunately pushed him out of the way because shortly after I jumped in, he left. So <laughs> right. he's got my email. I hope he'll follow up. That'd be great. Yeah. So. Um, so this is probably, um, I don't see any more hands up. Um, that was really interesting. I have to say that I became aware of your double contagion model. Um, I, I started doing, you know, I'm not an epidemic model or I do uh, financial networks, which is why yeah. I met at economics setting. That's what I remember. Uh, that's what I remember. Yeah. Right. So, um, but, I, but I then was looking at the early COVID data and I said, even before any official policies were happening, I said, obvious, it's just absolutely clear that human behavior changed the instant they thought that they had the depth. And then it occurred to me, you know, we're hard, hardwired to understand pandemics from, you know, a million years ago, right? There's never been, there's all, we have like in our genes, how to deal with a strange new disease, right? We run away, right? We're hardwired to do that. 
And you know, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Is there a, are there genetic markers that 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 you know are the where this fear mechanism is based in our behavior? Yeah, I mean, I that, it's a deep area of neuroscience. You know, I mean, the whole fear thing. Now, Joe Ledoux at NYU is really the king of the amygdala and uh, has yeah. quite a lot to say about about even the the neurochemistry of it. Um, yeah, and then I guess I was trying to make that sort of specific to disease yeah, yeah, yeah. and illness. Oh, oh yeah, no, right. Well, the other mechanism, yeah. You know, right, you other see somebody with black spots on them, you run away, right? <laughs> absolutely, no doubt, no doubt. Absolutely right, you're, you're quite right. The other, the other, there's a whole other literature uh, that's, that's also, you know, related, and that is the, the literature on disgust. That, yeah. That, it's a different part of the brain, and there's a whole suite of other responses having to do with that. That's also, you know, if you're trying to depict your enemy as a horrible subhuman vermin, you know, you depict them as, as rats and infected animals and all sorts of other bad things. So we're hardwired to do a lot, uh, and, and not all of it very pretty, I agree. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we're, but on the other hand, you know, the, the whole point is make people aware of that, and then maybe you can, you know, know thyself a little bit, and you say, you know, yes, I'm afraid, but I really shouldn't be, you know, and try to combat that or make people aware of their unconscious drives, and you know, elevate the behavior yeah. a little bit. Well, specifically to the anti-vaxxers, I mean, it doesn't help to say the usual things that, oh, the risk is so much lower than the actual disease and blah, 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 yeah. blah, that, that are totally ineffectual arguments. Somehow, you know, understanding their fear mm -hmm. is the root of the argument. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to say if they're really convinced that the government is secretly implanting chips under their arms for you know, manipulation or something. I mean, it's just, I don't know what you, uh, yeah, <laughs> not sure where you start countering that rationally, you know. Okay, well, I guess, yeah, so um, I'd love to keep you for longer. So maybe we'll find a way to bring you back for a second visit. Sometime. That sounds great. I'd love that. Uh, I could do a little more thorough presentation of Agent Zero and what we've been doing there if people were interested, you know. Yeah. Or other, any other topic. I consider me a colleague. I'm happy to. Come yeah. Back and talk okay. About well, maybe we'll okay, I'll follow up. It. Yeah, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about what MFBH is all about, and um, and we're we've got some really keen agent-based guys. I Fabulous. guess you know Nathaniel Osgood and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's collaborate. I mean, I'm up for anything. I really am. I, I'd love yeah. to do more with you guys. Yay! Okay, so um, that's great. So um, shall we just uh, wrap it up? And yeah. uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And, uh, well, thank you. It was it was great to meet you again. Okay. Likewise. Okay, Take so care, everyone. Goodbye to everybody for sticking it out, and uh, and uh, all the best. Okay. Take care, guys. Bye.